I suppose I suppose I should have invited, uh, anticipated being introduced by Waldorf, and so I'm not overly shocked because he invited me, so I knew he would kind of ruin my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and I was not. That's not true about me at Lincoln. Um, I did teach him all he knew, and that's why he became a lawyer. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I have to tell you first, since Bob is wearing the tie. And how many times have you ever worn that? Uh, second time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that's my entree to tell you. Uh, Julie gave me this tie when my book came out, which has been um, probably 10 years, maybe a little more. And I've worn it every time I spoke. And believe it or not, I know you guys who know me wonders the fact that I speak frequently, but I do, and I always wear the Dobsky tie, so, so I'm glad to see somebody else wears it too. She also, I don't know if I can show these, I'm too not agile enough, but if you want to see the most obnoxious, ugly pair of socks that's ever been manufactured, I'm wearing those today for the first, and Julie, I hate to say this, but the last time, right? <laughs> But if you want a private showing afterwards, we take the ladies. <laughs> um, theology is not my thing, but I was going out the door today, and Ruth Ann said, "Don't you dare tell tell them that." She has one of those calendars where you rip the, every day and rip the message off. And today she yelled at me. I went out the door, and I'll share it with you because actually it's not bad. Uh, if God can give a create an insect whose butt lights up. Think what he can do for you. <laughs> so it's all that one over it. It's not. Uh, I do have these two books. Uh, uh, and it is needless to say a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Welcome. Um, and I, I, because I am among friends, I'm proud to tell you this. Keep in mind, I'm, I'm, uh, I was a lawyer of sorts, not a historian, not an author. And the SIU Press agreed to publish my book, which always seemed like a miracle in itself. Uh, the run was 5,000. They're down to 69. There's all that are left, so hurry, you can still get one. <laughs> and they're going, they announced to me that their, their, their editorial staff is uh, going to take the book to the board of directors of SIU Press um, to have them hopefully approve the recommendation that they issue a paperback, which is sort of the nirvana for a book to go into paperback. So I'm very happy about it. just find that out. Um, thank you, That's why I have that I'm here for it. <laughs> um, my books are about the circuit, which, and some of you heard me speak, and, I, and I'm going to do something different today, but the circuit, just to put it in context, was 14 counties in central Illinois where Lincoln practice law, running from uh, one to the other to the other. McLean County was one of those, so we can be very proud of that. We can also be very proud of a speech he made here, and that's what I'm going to talk about. It's called the law speech, and by the way, having a guy from Virginia here is not equal time. To, at least he didn't talk the glories of the Confederacy thing. There's still time. <laughs> Don't poke the bear. <laughs> Um, but uh, to put, I want to put this in context and to talk about this speech because it is the law speech and therefore people say, when it's lost, why is it so important? Or why is it lost? So that's what I'll talk about. And I have to put that in context. If, and this is a quick history lesson. In 1820, the Missouri Compromise was passed by Congress, which allowed Maine to come in, and I can't remember the state from the south, sorry. But, uh, um, and, they, and after that compromise, they brought states in, one slave, one not slave. And that kept the peace sort of because of that issue. In 1850, it was renewed. Uh, in in uh, 1854, in January, Stephen A. Douglas, who was the senator from Illinois, and uh, it's sometimes said, if there had been no Judas, there'd be no Jesus. Well, if there was no Douglas, there never would have been a Lincoln. He was the leading Democrat 
And uh, he pushed this bill through, probably to appease the, the Democrats who were primarily Southern, uh, to appease them, but also to keep face in the North. He pushed through a bill called Popular Sovereignty. And he introduced it in January, it passed in May of 1854. Popular sovereignty meant that all the new territories that came into the Union had an opportunity to vote on whether they would be slave or not slave. Well, that is the, that lit the fuse that eventually became uh, the Civil War. Um, that was in, as I say, in 1854. Uh, Lincoln, who had been, um, he was a congressman in, in the mid 40s, had a very, um, uh, to say the least, mediocre term. Was the party didn't want him to run again, so he that was the end of his politics, pretty much. He thought um, there were two parties at the time: the Democratic Party, which of course still exists, uh, and it was really is the, the Granville Party, and then the Whig Party, which was um, um, a, a sort of a predecessor of the Republican Party, but but uh, the Whig Party had not elected a president for years. Uh, the Democrats totally dominated the Senate. They dominated, uh, I mean, the Congress. They dominated uh, all the legislatures, including Illinois. The only district in Illinois, congressional district, uh, still is uh, the one in Springfield, and we're part of that district. Uh, but in any event, so Lincoln got out of politics. He was so disillusioned. Um, and uh, he said, I, I, I studied, um, I practiced law more assiduously than ever before. Then in 54, and he, here was his attitude, by the way, I'm slightly, this shocks people sometimes. He was not an abolitionist. He knew that it was impossible to rid the country of slavery uh, because of the economic interests of Southerners. And by the way, Joe, I defend Southerners. They got all this money tied up in slaves, which is obnoxious, their most valuable asset of property of human beings. But still, that was an economic interest. You just couldn't say, um, well, let's, we're going to take you, we're going to free the slaves. Well, you know what? I got money borrowed on, the, on my property. Who's going to pay me for my slaves? Pay you? Are you kidding? It's, it's over. So he knew that. So the Lincoln, like many moderates on the subject, wanted to see slavery contained where it was in the Old South, never to be expanded. And uh, it would die, everybody assumed, take generations. Um, but everybody assumed that, therefore, it would just go away. And that was Lincoln's position. And, and that, that apple cart was tipped over by the uh, Kansas Nebraska Act. So Lincoln came, off, came out of politics, or came in, back into politics, and as he said himself in an autobiography, he wrote for, at the request of Jesse Fell, we all know Jesse Fell, who found a dorm and so forth, a strong advocate of Lincoln. And he said then that uh, um, uh, the, the uh, passage of the Kansas Nebraska Act aroused me as never before. He came back into politics. He made four speeches um, that I think put him in the White House. The first one was in Peoria, Illinois. The longest speech he ever gave, and and that really outlines his position on slavery, which is to contain it, to contain it, to contain it, not to do away with it. Um, then in uh, in the in '54, the Republican Party was founded in Ripon, Wisconsin, at Ripon College, as a matter of fact. And uh, well, that's not quite true. It was, it was in a small schoolhouse in Ripon that then became part of the campus as a as a site where the party came from. So uh, Lincoln in 54 uh, was not ready to jump. He was, he was conservative. He was in his, and cautious in his politics. He never spoke against slavery, except one time in 1837 in the legislature, sort of parenthetic close on a speech. So he never talked about slavery. There was no point in it. Slavery is where it is. It's always going to be there until we, it sort of fades away. Why should I take on that issue? It's not an issue in Illinois. 
And keep in mind, Illinois was embarrassingly racist in those days. I was shocked. When I really got into doing this whole subject, I was shocked at how racist Illinois was. In, in 1848, they passed black laws that uh, prohibited intermarriage, uh, made every free, uh, I, think they called, I think it was called Negroes, every free Negro who came in Illinois had to pay $500 for the privilege. And the, the dice were really loaded. Uh, against in, in a racist way. So then comes 54, and Lincoln makes his Peoria speech. He makes his speech in Bloomington, I'm going to talk about in 56, May 29th, 1856, when the Republican Party in Illinois was founded. Some local historians mis, misstate that it was the Republican Party was born in Bloomington. It's the party in Illinois that was born. It was already in existence, as I've said. And Lincoln was asked to speak at that convention. It was a convention held uh, by the by the this newly formed party, or the, the people that were in the party. It was Democrats who were anti-slavery and Whigs who were anti-slavery. And uh, so they met on the corner of uh, uh, the southwest corner of East Street and Front Street, where the parking deck is now. In a, in a hall called Major's Hall. Um, and that's where Lincoln gave this speech. By the way, Major's Hall uh, was sort of a gathering place. It wasn't there specifically for political conventions. Uh, this, uh, ISU's first classes were held in Major's Hall. Uh, Second Presbyterian Church, till their sanctuary was built, met in uh, Major saw. So this building was a notable site to begin with. Uh, the building itself uh, was three stories high, and the hall. In those days, what was interesting about the halls, when I come up here with a, with a cane, and by the way, I no longer scoff at the placards to have parking. It was great out here, man. I just pulled up. <laughs> I was parked inside the building. <laughs> But, um, but the, 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 the society then was not so kind. All the halls were in the top floors to catch the wind and, and whatever breeze there might be and, uh, and, and not worry about them being handicapped and accessible. So that was Majors Hall. And Lincoln was asked to give the close of the convention. There were 270 delegates there. Anybody you ever heard of who was an active politician um, in the non-democratic side was at that convention. It's extremely important. And Lincoln was given the opportunity to close with what has become known as the lost speech. Uh, and in that, he, he, it, was, it is lost. That's the interesting thing. Uh, because there's never no record of specifically of what he said. There is no, you can go to the collected works of Lincoln the multi-volume set of everything he ever said. They're just a reference to it because nobody knew exactly what he said. But it was the same speech he'd been giving uh, from, since f throughout the fall of 54 when when uh, Kansas Nebraska Act passed. Lincoln spent the summer of 54 studying the subject, didn't speak anywhere. And then he came out swinging in the fall of 54 and spoke uh, every, he, he used what was, Neat about the circuit, he used his circuit appearances as the time that they'd go to Bloomington, for example, and give a speech. He was here practicing law, so I'll just he, in the, he practiced law in the day, and then at night would would speak, would go back sometimes to the same courtroom and give a speech. Uh, so so he he did that all over uh, Illinois in the in the fall of '54. Then then '56. The Republican Party had been formed in Ripon, so this convention was called to form the party in Illinois. And this, don't underestimate Bloomington's importance in the Lincoln story, and this, especially this speech, because uh, of this speech, uh, he, that's, I guess that's my conclusion, so I better not give it. <laughs> no, the, the, yeah, let me talk about the speech first. Um, it's known what he talked about. It was the same speech, essentially, he'd been giving. But there was a passion here because of these 270 people. He now was totally committed 
to the anti being in the anti-slavery party, which he hadn't been in '54. And he gave this speech that, by all accounts, was the greatest speech he'd given up to that time. Uh, Herndon, who was his partner, uh, William Herndon, who wrote an autobiography, or wrote a biography of Lincoln, the first one, said it was uh, Lincoln's finest, the finest speech he ever gave in his life up to that time. Um, the Panagraph, which was being published in those days, said Mr. Lincoln surpassed all others, even himself, is their description of that speech. Uh, and uh, from that, the party was born, keynoted by that speech. And then, um, uh, then he became, because of his role in that convention, providing that fire for this new party, he became the, the head of the republic. Not elected a head or a chairman, but he became the leading Republican. Uh, the two other speeches, I, I say there are four that put him in the White House. Uh, the third one was the House Divided speech that he gave during the Douglas campaign of 1858 in Springfield, where he, and he frequently quoted the Bible. Uh, the House Divided against itself cannot stand. And that was speak, speaking truth that people didn't want to hear. Uh, so that launched him as presidential, furthered him along as presidential timber. And then in 1860, in February of 1860, he gave the Cooper Union Address in New York, and uh, that made him a national figure, and he was off to the races. Um, that speech, by the way, well, let, me, let me go back and talk about the lost speech, why it's lost. The legend is that Lincoln's speech was so eloquent and so moving that the reporters just stunned, dropped their pens, and failed to know what he said. Well, that's a great story, but Lincoln was too cagey. I mean, he, uh, Cooper Union's a good example. When, after he got done giving the Cooper Union speech in New York, he went over to the offices of the Tribune, the leading paper in, uh, in uh, New York at the time, and, and nationally, I might say, and went over their version of his speech, word for word, with the editors to make sure they got it right. So it's unthinkable that this speech was, which would, which I ranked that highly as importance in his in his career and his advance in the White House. It's unthinkable that he would have. Oh damn! I forgot to tell the reporters to write it down. That just wouldn't be true. I think the point is, in that speech, in front of these 270 people, he was preaching to the choir, and you, you, he could say things there with candor, and and somewhat frightening because of the ominous cloud that was hanging over the country, what's going to happen to end slavery, that he didn't want that out to the general public. That's my thought. That's why it's not published, not because it was so eloquent they forgot to write it down. Because he was just too cagey. And if he wanted that speech to be out there to the general public, I think he would have, that would have been so. So, um, so that's sort of what the law speech is about. Uh, it's, uh, Majors Hall is an interesting uh, thing, uh, a place also. Uh, Major was a member of First Christian Church uh, and one of the founders of that church. So he was an influential person. Um, and for this, for this uh, speech to be given in Bloomington is because it was a central point. And uh, so all of us who live in Bloomington, and I include that for normal folks too, but all of us who live in Bloomington normal, um, can be really proud that this momentous event occurred here in Bloomington. Um, it's well marked. Oh, by the way, the fate of the building, I should mention that. Majors Hall was three stories high. There was a fire on the third floor in the 1870s. So the building stood until the 50s, 1950s, um, as a two-story building. There was some move to restore the hall because of its importance, but they'd have to put a third floor on, and that just wasn't practical. So when they put the parking lot, those of us who've been here long, I remember when that was a lot, but when they put a parking lot there, not a deck that's there now, um, they they tore down Major's Hall. There was some hoorah about doing that because of its significance, but it was just impractical to restore it since it was already been burned down. 
So that's that's what happened to Major Saul. Uh, but it, it, to, to close, um, uh, Lincoln Lincoln arrives to the presidency. Um, we had a sermon at our church the other day about Joseph, and uh, it, it, it was what was interesting is the Old Testament story that wherever God needed, wherever this man in desperate need of help, God helped. God, God helped us. Well, I, I, I can't, you can't, I, I published an author about New Salem, Lincoln, or an article about New Salem in the, in the Journal of the Abraham Lincoln Association. And, it, and what I wanted to say that it was divine help that got Lincoln to be, be the presidency to save this nation. But if I said that, they wouldn't have published it. So in that article, I said it was faith. But what interested me when I heard this sermon is the path of Lincoln and Joseph, not their beginnings, because of course Joseph was from a wealthy family, et cetera, but, and Lincoln was, could have been more humble. But every, every time they needed a break, they got it. And that was certainly true for Lincoln. And uh, so, uh, and, and so this, this, and part of it was his own ambition. He, he's, he's in my in my book, which by the way, I'll sell to you if you want it when we're done. <laughs> Thank you all. That was a good cue. I brought us some if you're interested. There's two of them. Um, but uh, in in the introduction, uh, Lincoln, I have a quote. I don't know what you, uh, authors do this a lot. I, I'm told. Um, so that's why I did it. If, author, if authors can do it, I can do it too. But there's a quote from New Salem, a speech he made when he ran for the legislature in 1832, where he says, and this is, here he is now, 23 years old, uneducated, essentially a farmhand uh, when he got to New Salem. But he said, uh, in this run for the legislature, which he lost, by the way, in 32, 1832, he said, every man is said to have his own peculiar ambition. In my case, it's to be highly esteemed by my fellow man. And so he, and I love that quote, he didn't know he was gonna be president of the United States, but he knew he was special. He knew he was, somehow in his life, he was on a mission, which resulted, in, of course, ultimately, in saving our nation. And, uh, but, but our, the role of Bloomington in that, most of the guys that put him in the White House, led by David Davis, that's all true. And by the way, Lincoln, the day of this, yeah, this is just a piece of trivia, but it's pretty interesting to me. He was, he was on practicing law in Danville on the 27th, on the 28th, which is when the convention started. Or maybe it was the, it was the day before, the 27th. He took the train to Decatur. By then the railroads were out there. He took the train to Decatur, and then he got off the train, got on the train, and came up to Bloomington uh, on the train, and got here the night before the speech. This is the evening of the uh, 28th. He, he, the, the, the train stopped on uh, at the intersection of kind of a grove, and uh, let's see what would be the north seat there. Well, where the, where the tracks used to be. It's now the bike trail. That's where this train station was. He got off the train there, walked to the Davis's home, and not the house that's there now, but Clover Lawn was called, the big frame house. He spent the night at their house there. Went down that night, the night before, walked with a large crowd of supporters. What people walked that far? Amazing. And, uh, they, uh, and spoke to a group from the... Uh, balcony of a hotel, the B Hotel in town, which was the Pike House, which was on Monroe Street, just to the west of uh, Main Street. He spoke from the balcony there and gave them sort of a warm up to get them fired up for his speech the next day. So, um, and so, and that's essentially, Davis became his campaign manager, as you know. Without Davis, Lincoln would not have been president. It was his efforts at the Republican Convention in 1860 in Chicago that got Lincoln the nomination. And uh, for what, whatever forces were working that way, he's probably the only guy that had the persistence, the conviction, 
and the guts to see that war through. And uh, the result of his persistence in saving our nation, we'd probably be two countries if he hadn't been president of the United States in those in those days. So that's the story, including the loss. I did, did I start? Yeah, it's a lot of speech I'm supposed to talk about. <laughs> but, but anyway, that's the, uh, that's the story, the lost speech. The lost speech about the lost speech. <laughs> are, you, are you available for some questions? Right sure. Now? Okay. Yeah. Anybody? I, can I ask one? Sure. Uh, so you brought up two different places where Lincoln was in town that no longer exist. Are there any buildings in Bloomington where he was known, that still stand, where he was known to have been or stayed? Yeah, there's about 10, actually. Yeah. In downtown, and uh, I mean, this is a good question. We can be really proud of our downtown, and I'm, I want to see the downtown promoted. Sorry, and I did my plug for that cause. The downtown is historic, not just because of Lincoln, but because of all these things that took place in downtown Bloomington. And, and there's a move afoot uh, to uh, do something about that. I hope that that takes place. I will worry a little bit on how this is really editorializing. We have a ward system, so I'm a little worried that all of them who aren't in downtown will don't care too much about downtown, but that's another story. But um, the building, uh, my office is at the corner of Main and, uh, yeah, Main and Front Street at the northeast corner. That's a building Lincoln was in, the Miller Davis building. Uh, across the street is Angel Gridley's bank building, the yellow brick building which was the first bank in McLean County. Lincoln represented Gridley, who was an absolute, don't get me going on the Gridley story. He used to go get drunk. And his second floor office in that very building, that's all been restored thanks to Dave Doris. And, uh, and then he would go out on the street and just start swearing at people. And, and as they went by, hey, you know, they're dirty, no good, so and so he'd say across the street. He was a character, but he also, one biographer claimed that he uh, bankrolled Lincoln over the years to the tune of $200,000, which is, think of that in, the, in those periods, that's a lot of money. So it really had a lot to do with Lincoln. Uh, he was a friend of Lincoln's, which I always admired because nobody was a friend of Ridley's, but, <laughs> but he was loyal and so forth. But, but all these guys, including Davis and Phil, they're the guys that put Lincoln in the White House. Is that, is that your question? Oh, you want to the building? No, the building. Oh, the building. <laughs> <laughs> no the, he gave the, uh, it's now apartments. Fred Warwick owns, owns the building on Center Street where he gave a lecture uh, on discoveries and inventions. It, it was a lecture, not a speech. And uh, every, all the reviews were that it was terrible, boring. But he gave it there and then he gave it, uh, well, the, the building's gone now. Um, there was a hall where I think the restaurants closed, perhaps on the south side of the square. He, he, he gave the same speech there, but uh, but so so that was one. He was in uh, some of the law offices, the building, uh, the center hall at, where he made that that other speech was where uh, the upper floor. It's in the top floor. Uh, it's now a condos. There's a coffee shop, I think, or a donut shop. It used to be uh, well, the, the one that sold it was there. My son's, my grandson's first grade teacher had a, had a coffee shop. Kelly? Kelly, yeah. That thing. That, that, that. <laughs> um, and uh, he was in that building. So I, I count 10 buildings in Bloomington that, that still stand. I think we have more than Springfield because Springfield, of course, has the force of the state saving, buying buildings and saving them. We didn't have anything like that going. It's, it's commerce that has kept these buildings alive. And uh, so, and the, the most, actually, one more time, for the answer to your question, Blake, thanks. I'm kind of glad to have more time to talk. <laughs> uh, the, he, uh, he wrote, in, uh, in this, he lost in the run for the Senate, as you know, to Douglas in 1858 because of gerrymandered districts. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> but, uh, but he was pretty discouraged. And in the, in the, uh, the late 58, early 59, and Fell asked him, he said, you know, they're talking, because of the debates, they're talking about, he felt it was from Ch uh, Westchester, Pennsylvania. 
He said, oh, he said, I'm step back. You're a national figure now. You could go somewhere. So why don't you write an autobiography? And Lincoln said, uh, nah, be a waste of time. I'm, all, I'm washed up. But typical of Lincoln, by, by late winter of 59, he was off to the races again. So in uh, uh, December of 59, he wrote the autobiography. He, he wrote a letter to, uh, and this is really important. I'm glad this came up. Uh, he wrote a letter to Fell saying, you know what? He wanted my autobiography, I declined, but now I'm thinking it wouldn't be a bad idea. So that was his first visible sign that he decided to make the run for the White House. And he wrote this autobiography of Fells that uh, remains one of the most significant Lincoln documents ever written. So that, and that, oh, Fells, excuse me, Kersey Fells' office was in the building, uh, well, you know where, uh, oh, it's a, uh, Boutique on uh, the corner. It's on the on the uh, south side of the square. Bur 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 no. Yeah, Bur 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 yeah. yeah, that's where just uh, Kersey Fell's office was, and where uh, Lincoln and Lincoln spent time there. Kersey was actually he was Jesse's sort of unsuccessful brother, and uh, but he he uh, Lincoln sometimes practiced out of that building too. And that's where he came. Get this scene. I'll, I'll close with this scene. Because you can stand on the corner of Washington and uh, Maine. If you stand on the, where the bank used to be, uh, north, it was in south, south, south east corner. South east. If you stand there and look east or west, you, you'd be like Jesse Fell that day. He, came, he was standing on that corner. He saw Lincoln emerge from the courthouse. And by the way, happily, the courthouse, the, the, now the historical society, uh, they have put a brass line where the Lincoln courthouse was. If you go in the entrance there off of uh, um, the Washington Street, you'll see this, this brass line there marking the foundation of the uh, Lincoln Courthouse, I won't tell you whose idea that was, but, <laughs> but so imagine Lincoln coming out of there, crossing the street, Fell runs, sort of hustles to catch him, can't, crosses Main Street, gets to Burpo's office there, and says, I have to talk to you about a very important subject. Sort of grabs Lincoln, drags him up the stairs to Kersey's office, which is those windows face the uh, museum, and that's where he was propositioned to write this autobiography that later became such a significant thing. The the the, uh, the building is very curious. It goes into the Livingston Building, where uh, there's a great bar there. Uh, I have to pretend like I go still go to bars, but <laughs> El Royce. El Royce. El Royce. Yeah. Well, you'll notice that that building. Uh, intrudes into um, the Livingston Building. Well, the stairs, if you, if you recall the lobby of the Livingston Building, it's all terrazzo until you, about halfway up the, the stairs to the second floor. And uh, so then the stairs that Lincoln took and with fell that day are still there. And they're worn. It, it's really historic. So. Will there be a third book? No, unless you have, unless you have room for me to, to move into. It's been announced to me. I ain't putting up with that anymore. <laughs> hey, thank you all for coming.